Yo, my name is Chris. I've been following you uh, really since like the started. I think it was like four a jacket back. Yeah. 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 Yeah
there's only so much you can do, you know? Yeah. Because, again, I'm on a mission to be, you know, founder, have my own dreams in the tech world, so you gotta have tunnel vision. If I sit there and go out and talk to everybody about everything and try to motivate them, then I lose sight of what I'm trying to do. So I try to like pick and choose every now and then to go to, you know, what makes sense. You know? And most importantly, I'm trying to make some destination, a place where I can put all these thoughts so that anybody can just consume. That's what I think is missing, you know. People want the information, they'll take it however, give it to me as long as I give it to them. So right now I'm kind of quiet. Thank you. Everybody's on podcast. I can't even do that. super evident that the real, real scarcity is a lack of diverse fund managers, yeah, right? So we need more of us in charge of allocating the resources. And, and that is really the problem that I feel there's not nearly enough attention to this place. Um, and so the fact that you guys are all, all out here, you know, our body, you want to get in the space, bright young minds, like this is when it starts. And my partners who are on the way down here right now, we, we made a decision as a firm, hey look, we want to proactively loop all you guys in and you know, create opportunities to, to you know, have meaningful work for you guys to get involved in and actually learn. Cause, I mean, this shit is hard. Like, it's hard, it's, there's a lot of looking at deals. Um, there's a lot of, we can get into the questions, but yo, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of it that is like the numbers, and in fact, my, my partner Jerry and a few of the guys that are, that are coming through are more number based. But then there's a lot of it also that is more uh, kind of intuition driven, right? So for me, and every investor kind of has their own different approach, but for me, it's always intuition first, and then I'll use the numbers to back that up. So with that said, yo Jerry, you want to join me up here? Yeah, I'm here. So we want to take as many questions as you guys got. There's only like a 30 minute break. So I don't know if you, who's got a question about the rapid fire. I got a question. Right, so what are some of the, the red, like you talking about intuition, what are some of the red flags that you see like, hey, this not, might not be an investment opportunity? Okay, okay, so when it comes to intuition, oh, come up here. These are my partners on three. And this is Jerry. Jerry. So this is HBCU uh, Venture Student Team. Venture. Um, and we're just doing a rapid fire Q&A for 30 minutes, right? And we also got some other folks in the crowd. Uh, the first question was, what is the, what are some red flags? Because I told them, yo, know, some of his intuition, some of his numbers. So what are some of the red flags when it comes to like, on the intuition side? Um, and we can each kind of go into it. Uh, I don't know, you guys got some thoughts? Yeah. Next time one. One big red flag is if the founder's not full time. Um, I think Michael Simon was talking about Somebody's not 100% in, why would you put your money into that? Um, you want them to be fully committed, making sure that they're executing. Um, the biggest thing is it's already hard to be an entrepreneur if you're full time. So if you're only doing it part time, it's going to be even that much harder. Um, another quick thing to that point is if the founders kind of buy themselves. Um, some people can do it, but it's much harder to run a business if you're a solo founder. And so now, from experience, we're only focusing on companies that mm. have a strong kind of management team. Mm. You know, I would say more on the quantitative side, like not understanding your business. And so like when you ask the founder, like, hey, how many customers you have last year? What was your revenue? Uh, what's your traction? What's your burn rates? How much money are you spending on a monthly basis? Like things that are just like very high level. And a lot of times the founder says, oh, like my CFO knows that or somebody else. It's like, no, like you're the CEO. Like you need to know at the beginning of the business, like how the business is tracking because you should be making do decisions based on that on that right. data. Right. So that's like for me, that's just like a non-starter. Like right. you don't understand your profit, your revenue, your customers, and you're relying on somebody else to like get your business at this level. That's just not it's not a good start. And then just just for some context, like so we are you know Harlem Capital. We've made six investments. So we're you know we're not Kapoor Capital that's been around for you know 10, 20, 20 years. Like we're some young cats that we came together and we're like, yo, can we pool our capital? Like it's literally the group of you guys saying like, yo, I got a G, who's got, who's got a G? And like you, you pull your capital. And one thing that I've learned is, it's not so much about the scale of the investment or what have you when, it, when you start. It's more so irrespective of the scale, it's getting in the process of doing it. 
So just you guys getting into the mental space of looking at companies, of evaluating founders, of like all, all of a sudden after as time goes on, you start kind of internalizing experientially what it feels like when you speak to someone that's fully committed. What it feels like when you speak to a company that's on the rise. Right, like this is one of our portfolio companies right here. It's an honor for us to see like the incredible team that Blavity is, at, you know, combine all these minds from all across the country. So you start, you start getting in front of all these opportunities. And so I want to encourage you guys to get started. Let's. I was just curious. We'll go to next I was just curious to know. I have a brand, Mess in a Bottle. So we put messages on T-shirts and they come packaged in a reusable yeah. bottle. We're growing organically already, and so we're in the process now where we're going into the tech space where we are trying to acquire like Mess in a Bottle vending machines. Um, I'm just wondering, like, should I let the process happen where we're already expanding, things are growing organically, and it's happening? Should I seek investment? I'm like, so you know, but I know I need the capital to really expand to the next next level of my business. So how do you know? Do you let it organically grow and do it yourself as the business owner, or do you really take that chance and you know seek outside investment? I think Michael put it perfectly. Like you, you don't want to scale until you need to scale, and you also don't want to scale until your product is. Like the market is spoken, right? Your customers are spoken, the unit economics make sense because if you're not making money on a per unit basis and you scale that, you're just gonna continue to lose more money. Mm. So really understanding like, am I at the point where I have a very solid foundation, solid business, my customers, I have enough. He said 10 is like your first, you have 10, 100 really loyal customers who are kind of doing the marketing for you. And then like that's when the moment you can say like, okay, maybe I need more outside capital. And as you talk to other investors, people are gonna give you that feedback. Right, they're gonna say, hey, like, I think this is a flaw. I think it's really hard to scale this way. Like, what if you pivot this way? How's your marketing strategy? Mm -hmm. So like, I think talking to people will also help you understand, like, are you at that point where it's kind of worth it? Because like giving up equity and not being your own boss is right. a disadvantage as an entrepreneur. It's, it's something, scary. Like, right. It's a really good quote. Like somebody said, a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs for three reasons. They want to make more money. 99% of startups fail, so you're probably not gonna make more money, right? They want to be their own boss. If you're a solo entrepreneur, you don't want to scale your business, you'll be your own boss. But if you take VC money, you're not going to be your own boss. <laughs> and you want to have better right. lifestyle, right? You want to like not have somebody determine your hours. If you're a founder, you're going to work a lot more hours. Exactly. Right. So if you're doing if you're doing a startup for those three reasons, you're probably going to fail. Yep. Right. The okay. reason you should do a startup is because you want to change the world. Absolutely. You believe that your product is the product that's going to help a need, and so all those other factors like don't matter. And so I think once you kind of know that like this is the product, I think it's going to change the world. Then like you're like okay. I'm ready to take that risk like let me go get some and some, sometimes though changing the world just means changing your world yeah. right like jay jay has a line he goes and there's much bigger issues in the world i know but first i got to take care of the world i know yeah. right mm -hmm. and like for me my first win was selling a dry cleaner who gives a shit? I sold the dry cleaning like it's not a huge deal, but it changed my whole world. It changed my confidence. It was like, all right, cool, I know I could do that. I shook that off, like, all right, what can I do next? Then I set out to do an incubator. And then I was in a position where I was able to, to impact more lives. And then over time, that has now transformed and has evolved into doing venture. So, you know, I, I do believe that when, you know, to, to solve, to create a company that goes out to impact billions of people, it takes an incredible amount of passion. But sometimes you just need to start with, you know, what's, with what's in front of you and do the best you can with what you got. Um, so, you know, just get really focused on making sure that your product, that there's a, a small amount of people that love your product. And then from there, we can talk about raising money. And if you want to have that discussion, we're here for everyone, right? Info at Harlem.Capital. That's that email is a shared email that hit every single one of our inboxes. Do another, I do want to add real quick yeah. to that. I think it's important learning for everybody. Um, anytime you're making a big business decision like that, so should I finance, should I fundraise, should I not, make sure to get a variety of opinions, right? There's never a right answer, um, a perfect right answer in every scenario. You want to do what's best for you, and you want to take every piece of advice you get with a grain of salt. Right. Um, there's people that have raised too much money and it's blown up their business. People that have raised enough money or were never able to grow and see their potential. So think about that. Because we're exceeding like what I can handle at this point. Yeah. So that's why you know I'm just trying to decide what to do next. Yeah. Right. Just so. think about it. There's several avenues of financing. Like you can go and raise VC money. You can also potentially raise debt notes, right? And even if you're going to raise equity, you can go to a, an institution or you can go to friends and family first. Maybe if you only need 50k you rather scrape together with friends right. and family. That's what give I'm you more leeway. Mm -hmm. You may not need the money back in 10 years and won't be riding you. Also, fundraising is a very time-intensive process. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, 
anything you're doing now is your business, it may take two or three X that if you're also fundraising. But, so just keep that in mind and okay. get some good opinions. Thank you so much. You guys right here. First off, thank you gentlemen for the service. Yeah, absolutely. Guys. Marketplace that connects Airbnb hosts with local cleaners to facilitate hotel gray turnovers. Okay. And we've been building a lot of traction, collected 72,000 revenue to date, bootstrapped the entire way. Congrats, bro. To where I'm actually soliciting investment. Okay. I actually just sat down with a meeting with Flying Fish VC in Seattle. So cool, man. Be it tomorrow. Good for you, brother. Now, I'm at the point where I want to know what was some of the things that you guys use to best assess VCs. What is like the good VC versus the bad VC? Mm. And I also want to share. That's one, one thing. Okay. Like a lot of like when we look at founders, we're doing reference checks on you guys, mm -hmm. right? So like usually it's a very small world. So if you go on LinkedIn, you can buy people. You should do the same thing for VC investors. Mm -hmm. Like you should figure out like take like if I know what founders are my friends, I know these VCs, and like have them do like like reference checks. Like hey, if I get this money, is it going to be just money? Because a lot of VCs are just money, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to be any really resources? They're going to actually like help me build my like my product. Are they going to take my phone call once a month? So you want to really know that and like having a VC tell you that is very different than having somebody who's actually worked with the VC. Mm -hmm. we're, we're selling you just like you're selling us. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I think like when you're on the sell side, you gotta like figure out how to get to the other side and figure out what's the true position of this VC. One and thing I, I will add, too. I'll add there is um, when, when I started in this game, I thought that money was the key. And then once you once you jump into the space, you realize there's a lot of idle money. A lot of idle money. <laughs> so there's a lot of idle money, right? But there's, there's, so that's that's what we call dumb money, right? But you can be aligned with smart money that, per what Henri was saying, there's a lot of value add per dollar. So when you get an investment for us, for, for example, we're rolling our sleeves up. JT and Henri, they hold down the financial analysis. Like if one of our portfolio companies needs some type of help with their product, because they're rolling out a new line and they want to do some unit, unit economics, and we tap their specialty. Brandon and I are more media oriented so we can help you promote the product and so forth so as you're thinking through it for instance me I had a cleaning business that was my first business so this is potentially good strategic value add uh, you know match right here because I know the business I work with hotels I work with enterprise clients on the cleaning side specifically so I can help you think through the business so I'd rather take a 25k check from me than a 25k check from someone who you know is a chiropractor and is just looking to invest in a startup so you can talk about it at a cocktail party mm -hmm. you know so that also begs the question what stage do you guys use that's the early stage. Early stage. Seed series A. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Some some back. Back up. Hi, I'm from LA. Hey, okay. One of the founders of Blackwood LA, originally a lifestyle. Um AC in LA we provide, you know, a guide to all of the events that are happening for black millennials and connecting with black businesses. And, so, and I also work full time in macro. <laughs> hey. Uh, which is one of the investors left. Yep. yep. And so my question is, thank you. So my question is like, how does one, you were mentioning like, if someone isn't full time, you know, seriously, what is, do you have any advice for people who, you know, like we are part time and like, you know, make, trying to figure out when and how to make that work? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a balance. I think we started this when we had jobs. Mm -hmm. no, they, they had jobs. <laughs> <laughs> they had jobs. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> It's extremely beneficial because I think the benefit of having a job while you're doing this it allows you to do this right? because now you're making business decisions for the business and not to put food on the plate. Yeah. I think when you have to start making business decisions to put food on the plate, you're not going to think about it. Right? I think in the beginning, it's actually really beneficial to have a job that's helping you pay the bills and you're doing the side of so I think for me, like, we went to business, we're a business for now, so it kind of helps. But I knew where it got to the point where I was at work like, every day for like four hours and all I'm thinking about is that business. And I'm like going into the office That's to like do my own work. <laughs> and it's just like you, you just feel like you don't, you're not meant to be there. Yeah. You see, it's this point where you just can't keep fooling yourself. And like the money and the salary and the on things is not enough. So you just realize that this is a point where I just have to do it. But I think having a job is nothing wrong. I think once you get to that point, that job is becoming really underwhelming. But until you're at that point, don't feel like you're obligated. Mm. You've got to have something to pay you to start your business. So I'll, I'll add to that here because I, when before I became an entrepreneur, I was a doorman, right? So by no means a luxurious job. For me, right? 
you start as a side hustle. It's important, it's, it's actually an advantage in a way because you have less time, so you gotta make sure that time is efficient. And so as, as you have the side hustle, you nourish the side hustle and it's growing and it's growing and you will eventually get to the point where it costs you more money to stay at your job. Oh, time. When it costs, because I found myself at my job, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, yo, I, I actually cannot be here because I have a business to run. Mm -hmm. That's why I dropped out of school. I'm not supporting, I'm not supporting that in any way. <laughs> but that's why I dropped out of school, and that's why I left my job, because at some point, it felt right. Yeah. And, and so, nourish that side hustle until it costs you money, and it needs to become your core hustle. And I want to chime in really quickly. Um, I feel like we're talking to ourselves a little bit, but it's because it's nuanced. Yeah. So for you, it may be better. You may be better off by getting your full-time job as long as you can. But from the investor's perspective, you right. put yourself in our shoes. We may not want to take that risk. And the one thing to keep in mind is that we're going to be looking at hundreds of deals. And if we see a company, if all things being equal, there's somebody who's full-time, somebody who's not, we'll probably choose a full-time person. Right. But that said, you got to do what's best for you. And if mm -hmm. you have like children or a mortgage or whatever, you don't want to do anything that's not cool. Um, but you want to make sure that you're able to be your best. Sometimes right. that means having a full-time job right. longer than that. Guys, I want to take a, a huge picture with all of us. Can we do that? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, okay, let's do it with the.